slasher killing him. And then you'll blow up. Everything could be improved if you just put Spongebob lines over it. Even the movie we're watching today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Ah! Ah! Well, that's good. I needed to wake up. Hopefully you didn't <laughs> fucking deafen our awesome... Oh, yeah, listeners. Jesus. Sorry, I was trying to... <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to do the thing where SpongeBob gets scared and he th- just starts screaming. <laughs> I thought you were doing the Citizen Kane transition where <laughs> the parrot, or the audience is going to be asleep, so we have a loud parrot screaming. <laughs> the- oh God! Okay, we're both loopy today. This is going to be a fun episode. Hi everyone, welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max and I'm Austin, and today's movie is Citizen Kane. Yes, um, this is a, it's a pinnacle of cinema. Oh wait, Austin. This, I don't remember this bad CG. Oh, I read that wrong. I'm sorry. Child's Play. Yeah, it's very similar. I I get you. They're very tonally similar movies. Um, They're both based off William Randolph Hearst. (laughs) Obviously. We can't go off the rails this quickly. Well, we all know what happened to William Randolph Hearst. He got shot by Chris Sarand. (laughs) Yeah, and our (laughs) listener is going to shoot us if we don't get back on topic. But yes, we're doing uh, the 1988 film Child's Play. Uh, Surprisingly, not my pick. It was. uh, I think it was your pick. Listeners, you don't know this, but there was a huge heated argument. Punches were thrown. Uh, Blood was shed. Max has a Nations giant were destroyed. cut above his eye right now because we could not decide who's, who actually made this pick, and we started fighting over it. And I think I won. I think this is your pick. This is not my pick. Okay, if you want the real behind the scenes, Austin rewatched this movie for the pre-screening, realized that it was kind of boring, and is now trying to shove the blame on me. I didn't really have an interest in rewatching this movie. Um, if we wanted to talk about a slasher movie, there are plenty of others I'd want to do. If we wanted to talk about franchise movies that recently got remade, which is a convenient time to be bringing this up because this just got Because Charlie's remade. Angels. Oh, no. Okay. It's a franchise. It's a franchise, Charlie's Angels. Chucky's Angels. There you go. That'd be cool. Anyway, we were... This had just been like... We had been trying to like think of movies and this had been on like the back burner of just like, oh no, we'll do that next week forever just because we we're pretty much on the same page for this movie and it's easy to talk about so we don't have to do a lot of additional research. And and then the new one came out and our cynicism kicked in. Yes. Um, also, as a cute little thing, I... Uh, the, this is around the one year anniversary of when we uploaded our Ugh. first episode. So, and as a f- fun little thing, one of the first episodes we ever recorded that is not available, but we were doing to practice and get our bearings was child's play. So it's a, also a coincidental sort of circular thing for us. Yes. So if you're secretly a 40 year old mother, who's very sentimental on the inside, like Max, yes, you might be crying right now. I'm a, I'm a thinking of the of past. Most. Yes. And if you're a cynical, dead inside person with no emotions who just wants to make fun of things, this is going to be a good episode for you because we're not huge fans of this movie. It's kind of split down the middle for me. I think this movie is so bad that you would make fun of it. But what is your general opinion on it? Uh, I'm. <sighs> this is going to be hard because I think we're going to say the exact same thing. I'm kind of disappointed with this movie is the best way I can put it. I don't hate it. I think it has good moments. I think it succeeds in some of the things it's trying to do, but... As I'll get into much more later, I think it wants to have its cake and eat it too. It can't decide whether it wants to be a slightly more psychological horror movie or if it wants to be a fun killer doll movie, something that the sequels, which I'm kind of I'm kind of almost alone in the horror community and like universally hating the sequels to this movie. But I think it doesn't know what kind of movie it wants to be, and it doesn't by having one, you take away the power of the other. You can't uh, set up your killer doll movie as being a killer doll movie and then try to play it off like it might be all in the kid's head. Well, it's a question of tone and plot logic where if you can't commit to one or the other, it's it's going to create this weird like miscommunication where... This movie is pretty clean plot wise, but it's just like, it feels like it's just playing out in front of you and it's like, it's on autopilot. 
There's no, you know, because you know it's real. Yeah, there's no twists and turns. Yeah. There's nothing that you don't expect. Like, you know... Pretty predictable. Yeah, you know the doll's going to kill people. You know that it's going to take a while for the adults to accept that, but then they do, and then they're going to confront it, and it's going to... They're going to stop it, and the day's going to be... And it's a very standard horror movie. Yeah, um, and at the same time, though, you do have... You do have Brad Dourif as Chucky, yeah, which he, is super entertaining. He gives a great performance. And I think I can speak for both of us when I say we both really love the Chucky character, <sighs> more so maybe than the movies. No, honestly. Um, oh, I, I really like... The sequels have made it, so I just kind of hate oh, Chucky I, whenever he talks. I have not seen the sequels, to be honest. But I do love Brad Dourif as an actor. He's one of my favorites. No, he's he's great in this. Have you ever seen Wise Blood? That's I have a good not. one. He's playing like a crazy, he plays, it's based on a uh, Flannery O'Connor short story collection. It's but, pretty good. Uh, well, he, he's delightful in this movie. Um, the other actors are fine. The child actor is not insufferable like so many child actors could be. He's actually dead now. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Why? <laughs> what did that add? <laughs> what did you gain from that? Nothing. Just fucking with you. Anyway, I sort of feel the same way about this movie. Uh, I think it's very predictable. I think it's very standard slasher. And specifically, it's a very standard, like, 80s slasher. As we'll discuss more in the commentary track, this movie is very much uh, reasserting the status quo, which I'm not sure was their intent with this. Uh, We'll discuss throughout the commentary that this movie had a lot of opportunities to really hit upon the satirical elements, which it didn't really necessarily capitalize on 100%. Uh, Maybe if it had done that, we would be thinking about it a little bit differently, but as it stands, it's it's mostly a movie with a lot of potential that doesn't really pay off uh, all the opportunities that it that it sets up for itself. No, really, there, for me, there are good aspects. There are some fun kills. There's the obvious commentary on '80s consumer culture and that great moment where he wakes up and screams at the woman. <laughs> yeah, um, but overall, it's a pretty standard slasher movie that. I don't understand why the franchise is so well loved other than ha ha. I think it just came out at the right time. Yeah, I get that. But like, even to this day, people like really, really ardently defend the child's play movie so much so that like the sequel within a week has already doubled its budget. Like not the sequel, the remake, but it's something that I just never got into. I like this movie, but I don't see a like, I'm not interested in the franchise and I just wanted to talk about what I would change about this movie if it were really to speak to me as a slasher, as a psychological horror, or as a fun killer doll movie. Just the different ways you could do it. Well, the first thing I change about this movie is this DVD screen. Oh, God. I wasn't going to bring this up. But yeah, the I think it makes both of us want to vomit. It does. You have to stop looking we at have, it. We have this Blu-ray version of it, and... I think this is an old Blu-ray, too. Yeah. I, I don't know when when this... I think this Blu-ray was a 20th anniversary, so that would have been 2008. Yeah, but this is just, like, the... This is just nauseating. The DVD this, like, menu CGI. is a, bad, oh, a bad CGI hallway, like, lighting test just looped infinitely from what's supposed to be Chucky's perspective, but like, it's just him walking around a dark lighting test hallway over and over again. So yes. So we're going to start the movie now before we start vomiting. Uh, do you have any final thoughts before we begin? You damn bitch. Start the movie. You could, that's your best Chucky impersonation. No, it's not, but that's as, as much effort as I'm willing to put into this movie. Try it again, please. For me, for our listeners. This is how you get money for the Patreon. You got to put yourself out there. You don't even have a Patreon. We can. <laughs> we you can. damn bitch, Austin, start the podcast. Yay, there we go. Here we are. The MGM line. That line's probably dead now. Meow. Of course it's dead. Yeah. Along with the kid from this movie, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> he died killing that lion. <laughs> they, put, they put them in a pit together. Yeah, they were trying to raise money for a Patreon <laughs> thing for a podcast. But anyway, this movie does ooze the eighties, and as like I did mention that this movie does have some. It's pretty surface level, like making fun of like the craze for Cabbage Patch Kids and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles action figures and stuff like that. But like. 
it's pretty surface level and it doesn't explore that a lot. Now, my impression that I have from watching the commentary track available on this disc is that uh, the original draft was more focused on the satire, but that they toned it down a little bit. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good, and this writer has written all the sequels. So if you're telling me, again, I have no experience with the sequels, but if you're telling me that the sequels are not like really that clever... Maybe just this a, movie isn't super clever either. Bit. Like Bride of Chucky, I can understand if you find it funny and like it. The Seed of Chucky, Spawn of Chucky, whatever it's called, it has some weird, weird moments with the child. But I never noticed this, by the way. But check out Brad Dourif's spangly ass boots. It's the '80s. Everybody had to have cool ass boots, especially if you were a villain. God. Okay, can we just take a time out right now to say that one of the things I really think is misfortunate or unfortunate about this movie is it's a good problem to have, but Brad Dourif is an amazing actor, and you can see it in that moment where he's yelling at his uh, strangling partner, as it's called. Yeah, that's the... Um, I have the strangler. Why does... Is he a serial killer? Like, Yeah, him and his buddy are like the strangler duo. <laughs> on, also in the commentary, they mentioned that it's based on, off Richard Ramirez, sort of. I don't know what fucking sense that makes. Did Richard Ramirez worship voodoo or something? I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, you can see when he's yelling for his partner that there's a lot of emotion and desperation in that. And he's a very fantastic actor. And as much as I enjoy his uh, vocal performance for Chucky, it is kind of a shame that he technically is only in this movie and all the sequels, I assume, in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, there is a plot in one of the movies where like he has a chance to get a human body back, but then he decides that it's better off being a doll because you can't sell child's play without the doll. Well, what is, yeah, what, what is the uh, exact reasoning behind that? Uh, I'm remembering the line collectively. It's like something like if being a human means this shit, then I'd rather off stay a fucking doll. Something like that. Something very well thought out like that. Uh, but okay, so we're starting off. This is a fun shootout scene, but I hate that it's at this point in the movie. If this came, let's say, 65 minutes into the movie. You want him to turn into No, I don't, I don't want him to turn into Chucky. 65 minutes into the movie, I want this scene explaining how he turned into Chucky 65 minutes into the movie. I don't want it immediately. Well, the thing... Or at least, like, the entirety of it. I don't need him casting the voodoo spell. I can see, like, a way to do this. You have the cop chasing this guy, and you see them go into the toy store. And you pan up, and the apartment building that kid and mom live in is on the top floor and you introduce us to them from that. But we know that the cop was chasing a criminal. He's shot and he's wounded. We don't need to know that he grabbed a toy and did a voodoo spell within the first five like minutes of the movie. Here's the thing. I think you could have the scene and even its placement in the story be almost identical, but you have to make it slightly more abstract. Yeah. The thing is they spell out literally everything about it. And then as we're going to see here, the entire place explodes with like an ungodly fury from a lightning strike. So we know also, is this the only voodoo spell that not Tony Todd taught him? Like, well, we'll get to the, him not being Tony Todd either. Cause this is the other problem of this scene. Uh, one other thing to bring up during the scene is that I actually think this toy story, toy story, this toy land area is a great representation of uh, the sort of idea of the return of the repressed model of like looking at horror movies, which we've talked about to a certain extent and other things. Um, I think we've brought up Carol Clover and her analysis of slasher movies and stuff in the past. I think with the dead live episode and with this, I think the the thing plays out even more like with a one-to-one relationship of what she's talking about in her book where uh, she references a lot, this idea of, this pattern showing up where you have white science and black magic. Yes. Right. And, uh, those things do have like racial implications as well. And by the way, this is amazing explosion. It's fun. This is one of my favorite explosions. 
for some reason it's like it's like there's pressurized air you know what i mean uh so it looks really good and of course chris ranton just has a few marks I'm a little dusty. On his face. I'm dusty now. Yeah. Well, you can't see it, but he also shit his pants. So I guess that's more realistic. But anyway, so Carol Clover, her, her ideas about black magic and white science being the two sort of contradicting forces in a lot of these movies, because these movies often play off this idea of the other, right, embodied by the monster. Um, and that other is usually things that are non-white uh, and non-male, <laughs> right? And... Uh, this movie is is 100% bringing that to light. Um, another fun fact about that opening sequence, that's the same street where they shot part of the movie The Fury, the Brian De Palma movie. I don't know if you've seen that. I have not. It has a great head explosion at the end. It's about psychic people. He made it after how, Carrie. How how good of a head explosion? It's on, pretty good. On the scanner scale of head explosions. Brian De Palma... It, he's not so much a horror director. He made Carrie, but like he's made a bunch of movies that are kind of like horror adjacent. There's some like really decent gore in some of his movies. Is okay. what I'm saying. And here we get this kid. Yeah. Who's making, he's making breakfast. I do have to confess. I really love the, uh, the child, like the Chucky doll, the good guy doll thing that they say. What? Heidi Ho. I thought it was my buddy, my buddy, my buddy. No. Where the fuck does that come from? Is it... What am I thinking of? I don't know, Max. Okay, yeah, no, that was some weird repressed thing, but... <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. Now, Max, uh, would you be mad if your kid did this? I think I'd be mad. I mean, if I was... Uh, oversleeping abs- oh god <laughs> that's the real villain the, of the barney movie. looking chucky doll oh yeah. my god that's horrifying some five nights at freddy's shit yeah i'm oscar i'm your friend it's not that exciting well you remember when you were a kid and you saw a toy on tv and like at that moment you thought it was the coolest thing in the world i don't i know i felt that way more if I was going through like Toys R Us, rest in peace. But it was mostly things like dinosaurs. Like I never saw like a doll and was like, wow, I got to get that. It was like dinosaurs with dino damage yeah. or dragon things. I, I actually remember the exact <laughs> like line of toys you're talking about. Yeah. This is a disgrace, this kid. Yeah. Uh. He probably eats better than I do, honestly. Living alone in my apartment. And... Mom, wake up. Come on. So one other thread to sort of pick up about the subtext of this movie is uh, what we're talking about with the sort of question of whether or not it's real. And uh, while I think you could still have that opening scene, I definitely, I definitely think this movie has a commitment problem where it can't commit to whether it wants to be something that is posing that question or whether or not it's just committed to being a crazy doll thing, you know? Because you can do it either way. There's no yeah. r- specifically right way to do it. No, and I'm mainly <clears throat> talking about what I would prefer. But, um, well, we've also talked about that in the past. Yeah. It, we usually call it, we, we, uh, we reference the theory uh, of, uh, the, the writings of, I can't pronounce his first name, but Todorov, he's this Russian theorist. Um, and he writes about this idea of the fantastic, right? Which is posing this question of like, it's like epistemological versus ontological question, right? Where it's like, does the thing, does the weird phenomenon in the story, uh, have to do like is it coming from the character's mind or is it actually in the real world and he was writing about this more in reference to like detective fiction right but the same idea works for horror movies in fact a lot of horror movies are mysteries and i think that's part of the problem in this is because we are setting up a mystery that we know the answer to already yeah and whenever you have your characters just doing things that 
the audience already has the information. It's like, it's like you're just waiting for something to happen, you know? And even still, you could still do that, but you also have to give us something while we're waiting. And this movie, I think, is a little bit too committed to being conventional yeah. to actually provide that. Oh, getting clothes as a kid versus getting clothes as an adult. Max, what was your most disappointing birthday present? Or is this Christmas? No, no this, this is, is birthday. birthday. Yeah. This feels like Christmas for some reason. I don't know why. I think I just associate like the consumerism part of this with like Christmas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because everyone's got to buy. It, it's sort of a Christmas movie plot line where the, the person has to buy the thing for their kid, but they're all out. In fact, I believe that's the plot line of your favorite movie, Jingle All the Way. Oh, yes. my Tim Allen, one of my favorite esteemed. No, that's not. Sorry, I'm thinking of uh, Santa Claus, that movie. Um, Max, what is wrong with you? <laughs> same thing. Now I'm just thinking of all Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies, except it's Tim Allen. I did see Jingle all the way when I was a kid, but yeah, that's another way you could take this movie, which I'm kind of glad it didn't, but I honestly wish it did. I wish it would just go off the rails immediately. And it's like, it's his birthday and Christmas on the same day. I want this movie to do that and then have it be like the kid. Chucky learns that the kid is like the, like <laughs> is like the child of the age of Aquarius or something. And he has to kill him to bring in the second <laughs> coming of like, and the kid is like, you know, the golden child, uh, something like that. Uh, the second coming of Christ or whatever. And he's going to kill him and drink his blood. That'd be amazing. It, Cause this is, here's the thing. This is a killer doll movie. I want it to go over the top, you know? And this one just doesn't get there. Also, I think this movie has a kind of a confused subtext. I referenced in the introduction that uh, I'm not really sure what their perspective on their subtext in this movie was, but we're getting a lot of stuff in these two scenes. So we have this dork loser man who can only be said to be somebody who, like the director is just like, be that guy from the from these 80s movies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the absolutely the corporate the corporate shill he is no yeah real. the loathsome management guy he has such little power but he needs to lord it over all of his other employees yeah <laughs> and the fact that the performance is so cartoony you yeah. know yeah <laughs> oh he's insulting how funny. the Aunt or best friend, he's uh, you have bad taste in men because oh, you talk right. back. Oh, that's hilarious. Anyway, the point is that would be one thing, and this, I think this movie thinks the people who make this movie, uh, they thought that as they were doing it, they were making something that uh, really, I don't know, attacked the establishment in consumer culture. Yeah. But what it really does is it reinforces the establishment and it reinforces uh, sort of, I, I don't know, basic accepted assumptions by like normative culture. Because what really happens when you have that white science, black magic dichotomy is that it's the black magic that is being othered, right? Yeah. And when you defeat it, you reinforce that otherness, right? This is always the thing about dialectical progression in movies, right? You start from a, a normative status quo, and then you come face to face with something that's different and other and confrontational. Again, in, in the idea of the return of the repressed, you often come face to face with the thing that normal society can't acknowledge, you know, like homeless people, right? Yeah. In America, I don't know if it's different in other countries, but in America, homeless people are like treated like absolute dog shit. Um, and people have, you know, status quo society likes to enforce the idea that they're invisible upon them, you know? Um, and this is the idea for a lot to greater or lesser extents about people who are othered in any sort of marginalized community. Ooh, we have a split diopter shot. Speaking of Brian De Palma, by the way, look at the size of that fucking doll. Yeah, no, well, I think that's uh, Cabbage Patch 
kids were around the same size, I want to say. I don't know. I mean, part of it is that they had to make it large enough so they could actually have like the 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 like contortion yeah. servos in the face. And um, also like for plot reasons, we want they also did have to use a yeah. double with a little person inside for different shots, which right. actually I think those moments are really well directed. I think I think they sell that really well. Well, it's not exploitative. It's not like No. Like, because as much as as much crap as I give this movie, I would rather watch this than any of the Leprechaun movies any day. But um, because that those kind of just feel mean spirited a lot of the time. By the way, uh, hopefully the person who uh, was in charge of the Tucky doll is not listening to this, because if you look closely right there, um, the arm came off Uh, when she was holding it and listening to the commentary track. He like screams about it in discomfort (laughs) 20 years later. He's like, the arm came off and it looks awful. (laughs) Well, if you've done so much time, (laughs) like the titular doll for this movie. Right. I do have to say, I enjoy this camera work, even though it's so straightforward. You know, the way this is edited together. Yeah. But at any rate, so you have the return of the repressed model and it fits right in with that idea of black magic. And when you have that dialectical structure, you have the status quo that is being confronted by those things and challenged by them. But eventually what happens is the status quo reasserts itself because it learns from the adversary, right? And maybe it achieves a sort of synthesis, but it's always closer to the status quo at the end. So by the end of movies like this, the status quo is strengthened and reinforced. And it's not actually like it's, overturning or subverting the expectations of your status quo. It's just reinforcing them. You know what I mean? And that's what this movie does. So it's not truly subversive in any way. And I I think also that's, that's like kind of exasperated by the fact that this is kind of like a, a very Reagan era movie, you know? Yeah. It's about a cop who has to beat back a homeless person or a criminal. Yeah. I mean, he is, an evil serial killer. Right. But it's like, it's the heroic cop who has to fight the criminal element. You it know, is, it is weird. Like, cause in a pure Reaganist era film, like the cop, like he is there from the beginning, but he kind of just leaves the movie for quite a while and like, doesn't get involved until like, it's very obvious what's going on. And for this type of movie where you're celebrating law and enfor- enforcement as the only thing separating you from, the evil drug addict, homeless, gay, black agenda that's going to overtake America. Um, gay? I, well, act, no, I mean, in no, general, but I'm not. I'm just talking about. Movie. Yeah, anything that's non white. Anything on yeah. Ro- Ronald Reagan's uh, dartboard. But, yes. Uh, not specifically this movie. <gasps> dun, dun. Okay, random movie pitch. I want to see a movie about Ronald Reagan thinking the White House is haunted. I don't want to see anything about Ronald Reagan. I just want him to be fucking. But can you imagine a trailer for like a Conjuring Universe movie where it's Ronald Reagan Based and he's on talking a true to some story and he's like, and he just pauses. He's talking to an ambassador. We'd like to get this deal. And he's like, and he looks into the corner of a room and the camera follows him and you hear like the violin going. It's just Abraham Lincoln hanging out and, and then watching him. Cuts the black from the producer of the Conjuring. And ba- conjuring based too. on a true story from that one time Ronald Reagan said he <sighs> thought he heard a noise in the White House. He's on the phone with his medium. I don't know what it was, but it was listening to me. It knows national secrets. It knows the it knows the location of the nuclear football. It's working for Gorbachev. <laughs> <laughs> Max, we've got an idea on our hands. Soviet spirits in the South Wing. Um, I'd watch that. But here, you have scenes like... And the twist at the end is just that he wasn't on his medication for a week. <laughs> no, he was just on co- all the cocaine that he had busted. I love this camera work. By the way, that that person, I think, was... Um, See... <sighs> what? Okay, finish what you were going to say. I was just going to say a little fun fact. I th- think, based on what I read, that that... The first time you see Chucky on screen, it is actually our lead protagonist, little boy. It's his sister. Really? Yeah. Well, <sighs> that's the thing. This scene would be like much creepier and much more just like, what's going on? If we didn't know the doll was already possessed, it would be like, you can say that's a matter of taste. Like if I want the movie to be entirely in the kid's head or whatnot, 
and I agree with that. But like, I think it's like objectively true that like this scene, the tension is dissolved a little bit. Like we know she's going to die probably, but like, right. Well, we, because we already know the cause, like, it's, well, the real problem is that the movie is called child's play. Yeah. And we know what it's about. Right. And when you combine that with the way that it, th- that it begins, there's no ambiguity. And there, again, there's maybe a different way to take that moment to create ambiguity, but even just on that plot level, it's like you remove ambiguity and we know we know what's going to happen. However, I will say that this moment is not necessarily boring for me because I think the way this is shot by Bill Pope, who is a very good cinematographer, um, he also shot uh, Jaws, right? And I think, actually, if I'm not mistaken, he also shot... Uh, the Princess Bride, oh. the year earlier. We should um, do that sometime, just when we want to feel good. Princess Bride's a fun time. That movie's actually so sophisticated. Yeah, I know. Ever, there's so much to talk about it, but it's great. Yeah, it has Andre the Giant in it. Everything I've read about Andre the Giant, I'm just like, oh, you are a lovely human being. I'm sorry you had to die of your body being too Or no, big. I'm sorry, Bill Butler, not Bill Pope. No, the scene, it's well shot. I just think it has some of the tension. And he did not do, he did not do uh, you lied Princess to me. Bride. You what? Made a Who fool. did Princess Bride? Oh, I can't remember. I made a fool of both of us, Austin. We just lost all of our listeners. At any rate, I think the way this is shot is really compelling because it's almost like too glitzy. Like it's very hazy lighting, the way he shot everything. It's very interesting um, because it is very... Like the house is thoroughly lit, but everything is like a little bit overexposed and very hazy looking in a way that's interesting to me because it looks almost too nice to be real. You know, um, it looks like a very fabricated space. And I think that aesthetic is is like neat when you have something creepy sort of stalking around the corners of the frame. Right. Yeah. But it's not going to last long is the thing. Give Andy a kiss for me. I ain't doing that. He ain't my kid. And I also appreciate just the way they're doing the like stalking tropes. But again, even now we've gotten the first person view. So we know that it's a real doll, right? That the doll is alive. (sighs) Yeah. The moment it picks up the hammer, you, the question is over. So every scene where, there's a question of whether or not the doll has come to life. If it's not doing something else, it becomes purely like not even expository because it's not communicating information and even that, that, that we need it's expository for the characters alone. And that's the real, like, okay, I'm going to pause because this, this is pretty good son. <laughs> yeah. But how fuck it. But what I'm saying, like, when you see him pick up the hammer, that's the death of it. Because even as much as I dislike the opening scene, you could work with it. You could do a sort of, like, reverse twist where, like, the mom eventually becomes convinced that it's just like, no, the doll is possessed with the spirit of this killer. My kid said his name. And the cop like starts to go along with it. And then you just find out that no, it was the kid and he just heard the guy's name on TV or something like that. Like you could still do a twist with that, but like this movie has told us what's going to happen and it's not going to subvert it in any way. So the only thing that helps accomplish is make you making you feel sympathy for the kid for adults, not listening to him. But this is an amazing building, by the way. Yeah. I, that building looks amazing. But even then, like, in a movie like this, for the most part, you're going to feel sympathy for the kid anyway because it's just like adults aren't listening to him and he's alone most of the time. Yeah. I mean, that's really the problem is that it just can't commit. And it, it gets you, like, you know, the first time you watch it, there's, like, a little bit of a novelty to it. But after you watch it once, it's like really diminishing returns because there's not as much there, you know, it's just watching scenes happen. Were you questioning a kid without his parents present and you didn't even notify her? 
Well, he's a cop max. He can do whatever he wants, and he's he's morally right. No, you can't question. Okay, whatever. Max, don't question the police. And you didn't even call the mom, or try to notify her or anything. This kid loves dinosaurs. Well, every kid loves dinosaurs. I was obsessed with dinosaurs. Weren't we all? Now, also in the original draft of the script, apparently uh, the person who was killed first was just a teenage babysitter. And then they decided to uh, make it somebody a little bit more personal to them. Of the, the emotional auntie. Yeah. Not just have it be Jennifer, who's... Although in a weird way, it kind of doesn't make a difference. No, because we don't... It's like, yeah, we get to know this character for five minutes where it's just like... Yeah, she's a good friend. She helped her find. Yeah, she helped get the good guy doll, but she's also out there and talks shit back to her boss and tries to barter with the homeless person and yeah, gets strict with Andy. I think it didn't really up the emotional ante. It just made it a little bit cleaner as yeah. a script. Right? I get that. I'm accusing your child of murder. Just bear with me here. Well, here's the other weird thing about this movie, right? Uh, and I think we had this problem more as we were watching it the first time, is that people are way too quick to assume that it could be a possessed doll. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Like, we don't, like, I guess it'd be different if we established that Chris Sarandon had been, like, investigating the killer. But there's no flower on them. There's probably flour on the bottom of the doll shoes unless he had time to clean them off. But here's the thing, like what what Chris Randon is doing right now, that makes much more sense. Right? Cause even if he's not the killer, like I would just be like, Did you walk across here? Were you like traumatized, little yeah. boy? You know, like I don't fuck that doesn't mean you're fucking threw a grown ass woman out a window. Yeah, like how <laughs> Just the worst cop. (laughs) But the thing is, like, everyone in this movie is way too quick to assume that, like, the Chucky, like, possibility is, could happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they take, it's only, like, one round, yeah, round of denial before they start suspecting, like, oh, maybe it is possessed, rather than just, like, only believing when you see. Well, this is the real problem with it not necessarily committing to wanting to be one movie or the other tonally, is because... In real life, the answer will never, ever, ever, ever be that Brad Dourif is inside your doll. <laughs> yes. The voodoo spell he cast in a we toy can, store. We can cross that off the list right now. And you could cross that off the list for literally anything that could possibly happen on this planet. Right? Yeah. There's a, I saw an article uh, today about the Dalai Lama being very stupid saying there could be a woman Dalai Lama if she was pretty or something. Um, But you know what? Here's what I will say. The next Dalai Lama, I can cross off my list. That'll be Brad Dourif inside of my buddy doll. Yeah. The Chinese government has said they're probably going to choose the next Dalai Lama, so they could just build a doll to contain the soul of the spiritual. China, call me. Yeah. China, call me. Hire Austin. Regret that you did. Find anything about Mrs. Barkley and her son. Anything for you. Oh, my God. I hate this guy's mustache, to be honest. Well, yeah. But, yeah, I do appreciate that they at least use the good guy hammer. You really don't get as much, like, themed kills in that way with this movie after this. Uh, You get some stuff where, like, it's just because Chucky is small, he can fit through certain spaces. Yeah. But it's really not as creative with that stuff as I feel like it should be. But also, I think that might have really contributed to it being a giant box office hit. So what do I know, right? Like, I understand why this plays for a general audience because it's got some weird stuff. It's definitely got a marketing hook, right? But it's not too weird, you know? It's still very safe as a movie, I think. And I think the performances are really good throughout it. 
Like we can say that some of the characters are a little bit more flat than others, but Catherine Hicks is really good as the mom. Um, I really buy her uh, like sympathy uh, for her child and uh, her like apprehension of the police. Um, well, yeah, like if, and that's, that does feel natural. You know, if anything, it feels more measured than I would expect of just like you come home to find that your best friend has been murdered and the detectives are questioning your son and suspecting him. I would just say, get like, you get the fuck out of my house. But she does that in a more polite drawn out way. Yeah. It does feel human though. And, uh, I, I guess the only thing I don't buy about, about her character is the same thing I don't buy about any character, which is that switch, Right where you do start to believe him. Although I love this moment where he says, mm. where he says like she, he said she was a stupid bitch and she deserved it. But really the, the other interesting thing about this is like the motivation of like, of like Chucky, right. And what he will or will not kill people over. It's well, like, wouldn't he just kill the, like, the mom at this point, too? Well, no. like we, The other woman did as little as just turn off the TV. No, we heard uh, Andy talking through the wall, and he said, because she saw you walking and talking around. So we can assume that the reason that Chucky felt the need to kill the wife is, or not the wife, the best friend, is because his jig was up. And why... I, I guess that like just talking with this kid, he knows nobody will believe him. So he's getting his kicks from it. I don't know. And, and I guess as long as the mom does not believe it. Yeah. I mean, I think psychologically it's like very fucked up what she's doing right now where she's trying to like shut down everything he's saying and being like, no, this is a doll. I know she's freaked out, but it's like call a therapist, call mm-hmm. a therapist immediately. He watched at the very least he was in a room with somebody who died. Yeah. Uh, don't yell at him because he's talking to his doll. <laughs> and like, it's a doll that like when earlier in the movie, when she was like, Oh, show me how it works. Like you literally get it to activate by talking to it. Yeah. So why wouldn't he be talking to the doll? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. I don't like that line. Hi, I like to be hugged. I'm in hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like that, honestly. If you're going to go, though, we know it's a serial killer in the body of a doll thing, and you're not going to go for, and you're purely trying to go for comedy or just like hijinks, make it so that like he actually has to suffer of just like being this child's plaything for a while and has to go along with it. <laughs> He's doing like a tea party thing at school. Oh God, there's another one. Yeah. It's, it's the cabbage patch kids. Every cool kid has one. It's a kid in a uh, green Bay Packers outfit in was Chicago. It, no less. Was so this enemy filmed territory. in Chicago or yes. Okay. This is a great Chicago movie. I think Chicago is a wonderful uh, city for just like location. For, oh, you can see a little bit of the crew in the background there. Um, it's hard to get shots like that perfectly. Oh, by the way, this is a funny shot because you're going to see a car pause awkwardly, I think, on the left. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> on the left side of the frame. Uh, I don't know if that was like. I think they probably saw the movie crew and they're just like, oh, what's going or on? Or somebody was, uh, a poor intern was like, stop, stop, yeah. stop. And they just didn't listen until they saw like equipment in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> Who was this fucker telling me to stop? I'm not, I'm going to drive my car. Right. Now, here's the other thing. We're going to continue this thread of having uh, Chucky himself being coded as like part of a criminal underbelly. And what does the criminal underbelly do, Max? Well, they're poor people. So they use public transportation and uh, they hang out outside in the cold and they have. uh, They go to abandoned houses that are inhabited by other homeless cretins that practice witchcraft and probably worship the devil. And they. they're not white people and they uh, warm their hands over a barrel fire. Mm. How dare they? They do better call the cops. They do drugs that aren't. I mean, look at that guy in the left, right? They do drugs that aren't cocaine. Cocaine is only legal if you're rich and white. 
to be fair, most drugs are legal if you're rich and white. But cocaine was... They literally classify drugs differently yeah. to nail certain people. I, th- I, I, I hope all of our listeners are... Aware of this? Yeah, at this about point. About the difference between cocaine and crack mm-hmm. and how the legal <laughs> standards for each yeah. and how it's also to lock up more black people. I, th- I, I think our listeners are woke AF. Well, I don't know. I won't make any assumptions about our listeners, but now that they've heard that, they have no excuse. Google it. Wake yourself up, sheeple. I have to tinkle. Wow. That's a neat line. Did you ever say that as a kid? No. But, oh my God. So was this Chucky's plan all along? Was like he what? hoping that the kid would have to go pee so he could run in, into not Tony Todd's house? No. See, and this is the other weird thing about this movie and just another sign that he like the movie won't commit because we know the doll is real, but the camera oh, refuses to show it to us. We're not in not Tony Todd's house yet. Okay. This is the other strangler. Yeah. The movie has given up any pretext of it possibly being Andy at this point. So. Right. Well, the thing is like, again, it has this weird coyness about it still where the camera won't show us that it's Chucky moving from the, from the, you know, the little stoop that he put him on. Right. But we know that it's Chucky. And at this point, like you can clearly see the plastic hands and everything. It's just like, and really this would be okay if this was the first kill, right? Yeah. Because then, you know, it's Chucky and we're getting like, this is very much emphasizing Chucky getting creative with how he's going to kill this guy. Yeah. How do Okay, so, like, I would say, like, the friend, the mom friend, have that, like, have her be suspicious in the beginning, then just be like, oh, Andy, you need to get back to bed. And have it, like, be a close call for her without her knowing it. Yeah. And then have her die later in the movie. Like, I I don't mind that, you know, the first kill happens with the little doll hammer, because I think that's a cute thing to do. But the thing that this kill scene has over that one is that this is very much like a process. You know, we see him setting up the things that are going to kill this guy the entire time. He doesn't just walk around and then suddenly smack him with a hammer, you know, because then that's like building up tension without like really a payoff for the scene, except for like a a kind of like superficial way of killing somebody. (laughs) She's hitting them in the head with a hammer. If you're going to kill off your characters with a little doll, Give the doll an opportunity to do cool, like, doll things as it's doing it, you know? Gunshots. That sounds like where Chucky would be. Like, a neat way to maybe do this is to have, like, the, uh, in the first kill, right? You have Chucky, like, somehow, like, use his size to, like, scale down the size of the building. Yeah. And then what he does is he, is he fucks with her car or something. Right. Yeah. But then he comes back up and she's like looking and she sees like a bunch of socks tied together and she pulls it up. And then like Chucky's just hanging on the end of it. And she's like, what the fuck is this? Andy, I told you go to bed already. But then her brake lines are cut with good guy brand scissors or something. (laughs) Yes. Something like that. Right. But that's like a whole process that kill. Yes. Like this is really clever. By the way, this is interestingly (laughs) edited. Um, And they almost got. I was going to say, wasn't there something where like... They almost got sued by a lot of people. <laughs> this explosion was much bigger than they thought it was going to be. And yeah. also, they did not clear the surrounding area. So a lot of people who didn't know that there was a giant explosion going on, within, like I want to say, like a 20-block radius, there were like things flying off of shelves. <laughs> oh, my God. It's like that famous episode of Mythbusters where like they, they were test. I think they were literally testing the can you blow somebody's socks off myth. And the crew got a little too excited and we're in the middle of the desert and created a huge explosion that could be felt for miles around. It shattered windows. It knocked out electricity for like part of an entire town. Like myth, but like everybody in the myth did crew- to blow their socks off. No. Yeah. That's the thing. It was a complete failure. Cause it's hard to take off socks. No, but Mythbusters was 50% actual education and 50% just grown men looking for an excuse to blow shit up. So, and I can respect that. That in of itself can be educational. Yeah. I mean, it's better than Deadliest Warrior, which was... That the- is the weirdest show ever. Where, like, 
it turns like these weird like murderous groups of people into like fetishes <laughs> like but, i mean that has my favorite line in all of spike tv history which is oh that's a great list right there a su- favorite spike tv lines a supposed actual medical doctor going up to a former navy seal and going so why would you use a shotgun at close range just completely seriously i'm just like oh, oh okay this is great compared to what a grenade compared to <laughs> tell me Oh, no, now he won't say anything. Uh, Ooh, violent there. Now, here's the other interesting thing about this movie. I think this connects to our previous movie, Seconds, in an interesting way. Oh, okay. I'd love to hear this comparison. Where the movie Seconds, a lot about that is how you get, like, the capitalist ideology and business that is regulating the, like, mind and ideology of our main character. That's a lot of what it's about. He is talking about, in that movie, Rock Hudson character... He talks about how he feels like people have made his decisions for him and that he's been on autopilot. And certainly that's a big part of that movie. He's somebody who is uh, not able to find his own agency, right? Uh, And part of the arc of that movie is his getting close to grasping at it and then ultimately failing because he realizes it's this fantasy land that has been created for him. Uh, The interesting thing about this movie is that Another way you could take it is playing up that aspect where what if Andy did go bad in a version of this movie? Yeah. But because of Chucky, what if it was both? What if Chucky was really like possessed, but that he also started influencing Andy and started to drive him to murderous and like what if Andy did kill what the hell? babysitter but didn't understand what he was doing and was manipulated by Chucky. That'd be interesting. Well, what's the, um, is it Halloween four? The one where the return of Michael Myers, the one where, which ends with his like young, what's the girl? Michaela is her name. Yeah. The young girl, like in I the, can't cl- remember in the really. clown costume, like that movie. Oh will- yeah. I think that, yes, I think that's the one that ends that way. That's a decent yeah. ending at that it point. Is. It's not that great of a movie, but no. I, I like that ending where it's just like, you can kill Michael, but the evil will live on. I, I like that. But. Yeah. Well, it, it, it would make this movie more interesting because then you can actually really embrace the like living doll thing in a way that is not just a one note murderous moment. You could actually, if he did that, he would be like, he could talk to the mom. He could be like, so it seems like your son is implicated in this. I guess you're going to have to help me get what I want now. Right. What if he had a goal, right, with this voodoo magic stuff, and now he like is now blackmailing her? Because I think, you know, even the notes for that movie are present in her performance, right? I I think she does a really good job of selling her desperation, right? Well, okay. So I'm going to talk about another ways because I I, she looks like she's going to spank him. I brought up (laughs) the Twilight Zone before, yeah, because whenever we're talking about killer doll movies, I, my personal opinion. Oh, perfect. I have to say this moment is really well done. Yeah. But my perfect, like, so the episode of the twilight zone, uh, talking, yeah. Talking doll. Or is it living doll? Living doll. Talky Tina. Um, okay. I'm talky Tina and I don't like you. I think that's the perfect example of this premise where, or at least my ideal version of it, where you're never really sure whether or not Taki Tina is actually alive or the father is a drunk asshole, crazy person and is projecting his insecurities and fears onto the doll, but it kills him in the end indirectly. So it doesn't matter right at the end. It Um, sustains the ambiguity and it works great. And it belongs to what Todorov would call the cinema of the fantastic. Yes. And then on the other hand, if we want to go with another short that features a killer doll, we can do the only short that anybody remembers from Trilogy of Terror, which... Is that a doll, though, or is it no, more well, like... it's a fetish statue, but yeah. it's a similar it's idea. It's a similar thing. Yes. Where if you want an explicit tiny little thing running around killing people, that's another great way to do it. But, like, this movie tries to do both, and it doesn't quit hit quite the right notes for me. Yeah. But, again, there are a lot of different ways to do it. And I think... This is, the, a, this is a great transition, by the way, from like the 
lifeless doll to like the actual screaming and whatnot. I think it looks great. <laughs> I just had to turn that up because I fucking love that moment. I'm not sure if that will pick up on the microphone. Though. Oh, it's so great. The TV rarely does. Because she's yeah. like, it builds up to the dramatic thing and the way he starts yelling at her is weirdly anticlimactic, you know? Yeah. And, uh, well, he almost got away with it and she was about to like, it's, it's, it's wonderfully edited is what it is that moment. Because part of the reason it's so funny is because you expect it to be a bit longer before he freaks out, but it's actually the moment she finishes speaking. He's, he's just like, you stupid bitch. <laughs> and, uh, it's hilarious. I, that's a great moment. Also, his facial contortions in that moment when he bites her are just fantastic. They really did a great job animating the uh, the puppet. I believe the lead animator on this movie was a man named Kevin Yeager, um, who actually wound up marrying our lead actor here, Catherine Hicks. Really? Yeah. That's a sweet little thing I didn't know. And he, he apparently uh, uh, would just always torture her with Chucky dolls. That sounds terrible. I made that up. Uh, you need to stop that's making what I up do. random trivia. <laughs> no, of course not. But I want to live in that apartment building. Yeah, this is a nice apartment building for a single working mother in 80s Detroit. It was a different time. It Chicago. Sorry. Max, do not forget it. In fact, uh, <laughs> Chris Sarandon has like a funny Chicago accent in this. I don't think it's like great, but I appreciate that he's trying. The doll is alive. But also, you know what else is shitty about this character is that he's going to like fucking dismiss her as a crazy person, right? But then he's going to follow up on it on his own. What the fuck? And again, if we're just talking about like the police in this movie, isn't there a procedure for this? Well, this guy hasn't followed procedure. At all. Well, that's the thing about the police in these like Reagan era movies is like they don't follow procedure because they have like an assumed moral authority. You know what I mean? Like there's not these movies about the police and like that are Reagan movie police are like they're not about like the actual procedural reality of being a police officer. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're not like they're not like Serpico or, or either. Right. They're like they're about police being like vaguely mythological peacekeeping figures that are also, especially in this movie, like pseudo father figures. Right. And they're reasserting this like paternalistic authority onto situations and resolving problems. It's just, whether it's police or military, whatever it is. Right. Well, yeah, he is kind of filling in a father role for the single mother. Yeah. Child thing, which is, yeah. and again, they will reassert that more traditional family by the end. Yes. And right. He's, Dumbing down the female hysteria and the yeah. rash action of trying to do something about. Oh, look at these evil people, Max. Yeah, they're all they're not going to help her. They're all just going to start raping her on this guy's cue. They don't even speak English. I think they speak English. They just don't want to talk with her. And who can blame her? Or blame them rather. This uppity woman with the bleeding arm. That looks like it. The wound looks like it was really deep, though. You might want to. Yeah, might want to check that out. Maybe Chucky has like saliva, like a Komodo dragon. You don't know. Well, according to the later movies, his dick still works. So, which is a vital detail. That did they make the doll with? Oh, that guy behind her is dancing. Did they make the doll with a dick? I think it did might he grow a dick. I think it might might have something to do with the black magic that his girlfriend did to bring him back after he dies in this movie i have to be honest uh i think you could probably do an entire movie with that character just trying to get a dick for himself <laughs> wouldn't it that'd be a decent motivation for that character it i think it would make sense for that character yeah yeah i remember And now immediately, once she uh, wants this homeless person's help, this peddler, Max, uh, he doesn't want money, but he will rape her. Yeah, oh God. 
And they all just circle in and join in. Right. And that's, that's what I mean when I say that this movie really reinforces like the basic predictable, like predictable parts of like Carol Clover and everything. Right. It is really a movie that doesn't challenge authority or confront it. It just reasserts it. And really the way to do it to, to like challenge the authority would be to not involve the voodoo or homeless people at all. You make it the way that I think I get the impression they did with the remake is really the way to do it. Oh yeah. Do we want to talk about that there? Well, the difference in approach where it's yeah. like, it's a, I mean, it it's is kind of stupid that it's a smart doll, but it, ideologically to me, it makes more sense if you're going to do like more of a satire thing to make it something that just goes wrong from the beginning. Well, yeah. And also you know, like you make it something that comes from the dominant status quo ideology, not something that is repressed by the dominant status quo ideology, because if it's repressed, then when you defeat it, it goes back to being repressed and you have reasserted the status quo and it actually winds up celebrating the commercialism. You know what I mean? That's what it is. The commercialism triumphs in this movie. Oh my God. Max, it's like a math problem. No, Max. And you still don't believe me? Because you're telling me that a doll. No, it should be the type of thing you tell somebody. Because... Something getting struck by lightning doesn't mean it comes back to life. Max, have you ever seen anything struck by lightning right in front of you? Uh, not directly in front of me, no. Well, do you think it came to life after? Probably not. Was it worshipping Dumbala, the snake god? <laughs> I love how they just couldn't do Satan because that'd be too stereotypical, so. Well, it wouldn't be, that'd be too white, this is the bad thing about it being voodoo too, is that it also manages it also manages to other non white people, right? By making it this like stereotypically like Creole type voodoo thing, you yeah. know? Why would you tell her this? I have to say though, I'm generally a big fan of uh, Chris Randon. You know, what's interesting is that this is not the first time Chris Sarandon has faced off against Brad DeRiff. They were both up for supporting actor nominations in 1975. Chris Sarandon for Dog Day Afternoon and uh, Brad DeRiff for uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest. Well, we're having a One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest moment here. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the premise of the remake. Okay. For those of you who are blissfully unaware of the liberties they took with the plot for the second one, which I'm fine with. You can change things. Um, I still like the remake of the evil dead as a separate movie, um, rather than the continuation of the series. And they did something different with it. When I eventually get around to watching Suspiria remake, once I get over myself, I'm sure I'll like that. Cause they did something different. Uh, you previously promised that you would never watch it ever. I know I, I'll get over myself eventually. You're but. capricious. But so the basic premise of the remake is that it's like a smart doll. It's like an Alexa installed inside a cabbage patch kid and it can, it learns from watching you and it will react to your behavior that way. But a suicidal worker in a barely coded Foxcom factory, basically who has to make it gets fired by his boss. Who's like comically evil. And is just like, Oh, I'm firing you and you're going to go back in the streets and you're going to die. So he installs an evil button. So yeah, he turns off all the safeties on it, which is literally a fucking treehouse of horror gag from the Simpsons. Yeah. I, I always think it's hilarious in movies when there's like, they build things with a function for evil. Yeah, that's literally that. Why would you make it able to do oh, that? Oh, that's the problem. You have the doll set to evil. Yeah. But yeah, he turns off all the safety restraints and then apparently he starts watching horror movies with a kid like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So that's where he learns that violence is okay. Oh, see now that that kind of ruin it, ruins it too, because what it should always be, it should be the latent violence in the status quo. I do. We were talking over this scene. I think this is a pretty decent scene, by the way. Yeah. I, uh, it, it's a pretty solid car chase. Apparently their reference point for this car chase with the car chase from, uh, the French connection. 
which is interesting. Good movie. Yeah, I think it's a really good movie. It's a great, like, grubby 70s New York cop movie. Maybe the typical grubby 70s New York cop movie. Why wouldn't you just stop your car at this point? Like, brake? Well, he's definitely taken his foot off, yeah. off the pedal. Although, yeah, I... Oh, well, Max, your question is answered. Yeah, but he had so much opportunities before now. Here's my next question. Can Chucky actually die right now? Well, it takes a lot to kill him, as we see. He gets lit on yeah. fire. Can, can he really die in his doll form, except for like a magical death? Because isn't there some weird sort of... Sort of I don't know. Well, his, his girlfriend brings him back with a book that's uh, like... Ooh, voodoo, do you see that? Voodoo for dummies. Did you see that? I don't know if people could have seen that shot. When, when the car is flipping, you get a shot where you can actually see the crane with the light on it, and there's a giant flag hiding it so you don't get the the like the beam coming right into the camera. Also, apparently, uh, they had three cameras shooting this movie, and I think they lost several of them Why did he? during the sequence because the never, car took them out. I've never understood that scene. Why? What happened? Like he jumps he stays out in the car. No, he jumps out from behind the seat and is like, hi, Mikey. And then stabs next to his head and then just runs out just to like, is he just fucking with him? Or like if your goal is to get revenge on your partner who left you and the cop that killed you. Right. I know that there, you know, there's a lot of constraints to using a, a doll like this. Right. But I think even something as simple as like, cause now he has to go back for it. What I would have done in that situation is I would have had the same moment, but I would have had him successfully stab him. Or what I would have done, Max, I would have had him cut off one of his fingers to actually raise the stakes a little bit more. Yeah. So now he's bleeding out. Oh, God. He seems super annoyed. (laughs) Not like I have to make sure the killer doll isn't still around. It's like, God, now I have to fix my car. Now my insurance is going to go up because I'm not covered for murderous dolls. I should have sprung for the gold package. The <laughs> insurance agent told me that was there. Oh, my God. Max, is this where you got your inspiration for your wallpaper in your room? Yes, actually. and that I actually... I had to sue this movie for libel for literally just filming in my room without my consent. It right. was a very, very long legal battle. I ended up losing, which is why I still do this podcast. You're desperate for that Patreon money to, <laughs> to yeah. make up for your legal fees. Please just let me paint over my wall. This is <laughs> I've had the same one since 88, before I was even born. Like, this part if- of it reminds me of Candyman a lot. Yeah, that's the thing. Why is this not Tony Todd? Like, I know Candyman wouldn't come out for several years. Several years, but Tony Todd is still Tony Todd. I know we're both fans of Tony Todd, but it's not like everybody magically knows who Tony Todd is. Yeah. Especially in 1988. Watch Candyman, everyone. It's a wonderful movie. That was also two years before Night of the Living Dead, so. Yeah. The remake, that is. That was that movie Hellfest that came out last year. What movie is that? It was a very run-of-the-mill gimmick slasher movie. Um, this thing, Tony Todd is a solid, fantastic actor who has been in a lot of oh no, like, not great. Now his thing. Movies. Now his thing is, I'm Tony Todd. I have horror cred. I'll show up in your shitty movie for five minutes if you give me X amount of money. But can we get an actual good movie to let him do that? Like even even stuff like. I mean, you can debate the merits of the movie, but you can't deny that it has like a mission and it's well made. A movie like Bone Tomahawk with really amazing performances all around. You get people like Sid Haig, right, who shows up for two seconds at the beginning of that movie. And Tony Todd can't get two seconds in like a solid movie made by people who are talented. Like the one time that he has done that, which I actually enjoyed it, which is uh, the slasher... The uh, movie Hatchet before that series went off the rails too. Uh, I've never seen that. The fir- There's a wonderful joke in that movie early on where like Tony Todd's playing the mysterious witch doctor type and you think it's going to be an exposition scene and then it just turns out he's some asshole who got sued for libel one time and it's like, okay, that's a... So he's just lying. Yeah. Uh, it, it was Speaking a of joke. exposition scenes. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. 
Now, this is this basically is also the only po- point of this scene is to refocus the movie for its conclusion. And it is really just a drag. However, I do think that this movie has the advantage of, or this scene rather, has the advantage of being the first time Chucky really interacts with things in yeah. a way that is like not being like sort of toyed with by the camera. We really get to see him at this time. And I think they do a really good job. I think it's probably the thing that smooths the scene over, you know? <laughs> what do you think the serial killer named the Strangler was going to do with your fucking Him and his magic? friend, who is also called the Strangler. Yeah, <laughs> It's not just that he's called the Strangler. He also has a friend who's a Strangler. Also, why would you make a... I know this is nitpicky. Why would you make a voodoo doll of yourself? <laughs> That's the best question. Like Maybe it, it is ki- it for chiropractic? Is just like I don't feel like paying sixty dollars this week. I just need to crack my own. Pack. Max, here's the real question: If you take your voodoo doll version of yourself in your hand and you f- like you put it in your arm, right, and you wave it through the air and you go, meow, meow, can you fly? Yeah. And will you keep doing that as long as you're doing it? So you can be Superman as long as you have your arm out and you make the noise. That's my real question. But the scene also introduces a major problem into this movie. Where I know that Chucky is not the expert on voodoo here and that this guy is the expert. But it is not to his it's not to his advantage at all to kill him because this guy. How do we know he's not just lying? We know that this guy thinks that he's perverted everything for evil. He doesn't have some sort of magical defense for this. Yeah. The voodoo part of this opens a whole can of worms where it's like, what are the rules of the voodoo? Because now he has... Yeah, he doesn't need to... It's just he, like, oh... He has the voodoo doll. Yeah. And it's ha- like, why doesn't he just make that of everybody? Make your, Yeah, or make yourself useful for longer. Just being like, listen, it's going to be a long ritual, like... I can help you. I have all the ingredients here and then do something that will like freeze his body or take his soul out of it. Like it, you're the one with knowledge here, not him. Yeah. Because again, he could just easily, just as easily be lying. Right. Yeah. And without really investing in that as the ending, you just have this character that just shows up to be like a black voodoo guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then dies immediately. And it doesn't change the like, the, you know, the sort of demeaning, like, marginalized status of the character if he's more involved with the plot. But at least it's not so fucking random. You know what I mean? Or at the very least, introduce him sooner in the movie. You know? Yeah. Maybe during the ritual at the beginning, it's like, you know, he he like, you know comes in his pants or something when he feels like the wave of power. He's like, oh, he just did a ritual or something. You know, like they do in Star Wars. Al Guinness has to sit down after that planet is destroyed. That's the force, right? Sure. Or I think that was just the... Oh, I actually really love this diversion. This weird, like, Dickensian style, like, evil sanitarium this kid is in. (laughs) Oh, man, I wish there was more shit in here with this little boy locked up in this evil asylum. And he's horrified because Chucky's going to kill him. (laughs) And they're supposed to be like, (laughs) he's not like convicted of anything. He's not in like any like criminal asylum type thing. Like they have no evidence to convict him yet. They're supposed to be like mentally examining this child, not locking him away. Yeah. But again, if you wanted this movie to be crazy and zany, this is still what I'd do. Yeah, true. This is actually a really good performance moment where he's crying for real. I wonder what the director, what awful thing the director told him to think about to get this. Did they say the doll was actually going to kill him? Think about your mom dying. Yeah, you hear stuff like that all the time where directors will like tell children really fucked up (laughs) shit. You know that hot dog you just ate? Mm -hmm. I actually made that out of your dad. You just ate your dad. Uh oh. Now, Max. How does he know what cell is? <laughs> okay, whatever. Max. If you're in this situation, yes. This is some great force perspective with the larger 
the the like large set they made in the large furniture. Or I don't know if that's a set, to be honest. But Max, if you were in this situation, my favorite question to always ask you, how would you escape a Dickensian evil asylum with a crazy possessed doll chasing you? Uh, run away despite my tiny legs being very small and the doctors not being able to catch up to me despite them <laughs> seeing me. Do you, would you be comfortable stabbing a doctor to get away? Would you leave him as fodder for Chucky? Sure. If you had to. If I have the moral compass of this four-year-old child. Whoa, God, combat with Chucky. Have you talked with children? Like, what the fuck does that mean? A lot of them haven't formed empathy yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, they're all psychopaths, right? Yeah. The thing with children. Some of them are very sweet. Some of them are terrifying little monsters. <laughs> yes, but they don't understand yet. Yeah. I'm glad he has the sense to grab a sharp object. But I feel like if, if I was a kid, I wouldn't have that sense. Yeah, exactly. I feel like, if anything, if I had a sharp object, it would just be something, do something stupid with. Not at all related to stabbing anybody. I think I would only ever use it for like, I don't know, like cutting grass or something. <laughs> Like, I would pick up something super dangerous, but only ever use it for something that's, like, just trivial and stupid. I'm just going to inject this opium into you, and you'll be fine. Ooh, he takes his glasses. There you go. That's the move. Now, this is actually where the movie, I think, really does go, like, full bore into the craziness. Yeah. I really do appreciate this. This is, like, where I'm just like, oh... The rest of the child's play movies were pro like stuff like this happens in a lot of them. But it needs to be clever is the thing. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why this works well is because also, ooh, God, that's cre creepy as shit. Oh, yeah. Well, that's like the electric chair. Oh, my God. A lot of states don't use it anymore because it starts it's still not technically illegal, though. It's not technically illegal. Which is insane if you don't it's i not don't technically legal because texas wants to fucking execute people as gruesomely as possible but and it really is if you don't know about the electric chair it is maybe the worst way to die we should bring back the guillotine not just because you should eat the rich revolt but the guillotine is like honestly like less painful and like a quicker way to die than the fucking oh, electric i don't know chair. i don't know what the fastest way the the least I don't know. You know, uh, I'm not really for France outlawment. No, well, I'm I'm saying if yeah. we have to, but if uh, you know, France outlawed the death penalty in 1979, and their last legal <laughs> execution was with a guillotine. Yeah, they're very proud of it up there. They're bringing them to protests now. We need to start doing that. <laughs> I'm fine with bringing it to protests. Yeah. Honestly, I I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how I would want it to happen. This is a weird question to be thinking. I guess if you if I had to die a certain way, I'd be like, one, are there aliens? Do you want me to do a reconnaissance mission? Out of like death penalty methods. So you have like the electric chair, you have lethal injection, you have Which gets fucked up because they don't have doctors do it because it's against their Hippocratic oath. Yes. So that's why it gets fucked up a lot. <laughs> and you have firing squad, you have hanging. Firing squad is going to kill you quick, is the thing. It traumatizes soldiers. Well, yeah, that's why you have the blank bullet thing. You have five soldiers yeah. and one of them has a blank. But it will, usually that will kill you immediately, is yeah. the thing. So that, that and again, that also has a 100% effectiveness rate because even if you just get hit sort of awkwardly and it's really painful, they're just going to shoot you again immediately. So that one maybe is, um, is, is the best. I'm still with guillotine personally. But, but then you're going to feel your head off. Not you're going to feel it. Because it severs the back of your spinal cord real quick, so all pain responses are cut off incredibly quick. Well, new Patreon goal. <laughs> For $500, I will execute myself. What is it, Max? <laughs> Why? Why do you go so low because on the, these fake Patreon things? Because it annoys you. 
I refuse to accept that much money in the sense that I refuse to accept that little amount of money. Okay, $1,000. I'll kill myself with a guillotine to see how it feels. No, I think we should still stick with the cassowary idea. Death by cassowary. That's the $500 goal and no, the 1000 goal No, will be guillotine. We'll Both of these the are going to be much higher. <laughs> oh, yeah, back to child's play. I do enjoy a lot of this cinematography as well, and just the sort of stalking situation that's going on. I think it's fun and very well done. On the other commentary track, they do talk about how, like, Chucky and the boy, they were their goal for this sequence to try to make it like a game of hide and go seek, but they tried to do it in a way where they're like, they render this stock and chase sequence in a way that is comparable to a childhood game. And I think you kind of get that in this, but not like not as much as entirely. You could. I think it would be really interesting too to take this movie again if you had it more where it was like focused on the continuum between Andy and Chucky, right? where you could somehow have Andy be implicated in the crimes, but then it becomes a movie about him also personally having to extricate himself from Chucky. Even that, but like you could do something with the fact that they like Andy thought it was his toy for a while. Like you could have a fun thing where it's just like they are playing hide and go seek or something. Right. And like, Oh, and then Chucky, like you learn that it's real because he actually fucking moves or something. Not even that, but like, Andy's hiding somewhere and it's just like, Chucky, you couldn't find me. You're bad at this game. And then like Chucky looks there and Andy used that to his advantage or something like that. Or like you've gone of a funny moment. Yeah. If you, you have Chucky just is, being like, you, I can't find you now, bitch. Or if something. you had them having an actual dynamic, yeah, because they don't really have one, but I think that would be interesting. It, put, it places a lot more pressure on the child actor. You know, that's more of a challenge, but uh, I think that would be a, a really interesting movie to make, you know? Cause again, if we're talking about how like, comparing this to the capitalism in the movie seconds and how like in that movie capitalism regulates ideology and thought it's like if Chucky is, if you do this movie to where where Chucky is not like a home, like a criminal, but is just part of this establishment status quo, you can have a, a moment where he's like regulating Andy's mind in a way that's like deviant and evil. You know what I mean? But it's part of the latent violence in the capitalist status quo. That would be an interesting way to do this movie, right? Um, and then you have it be like a cat and mouse game situation where, you know, Andy has to defeat him on his own terms. And those terms are the terms of like child's play, right? Yeah. The terms of games, play. How do I get myself psychologically out of this situation? I'm going to create a safe space for myself where I can defeat Chucky, right? So he has to defeat him by using his like, the creativity and imagination of being a child. That'd be interesting, right? Yes, because the adult world has failed him. The cop didn't believe him. His mom didn't yeah. believe him. So he's going to use his own tactics to do it. Yes. And that would be really interesting as like ideologically a new solution to this problem where, uh, you know, like these childhood tactics are become an effective way to combat yeah, do a this fucking, dominant ideology do that a wants to manipulate him. Home Alone thing at the end, like that could be fun. Yes, that is that is a good reference point for this because Home Alone is, you know, is is more focused on integrating the childhood aspect of that into the movie. You know what I mean? That's that's a very good point. This could have been similar to that in the sense that it's a slasher movie, but understood more on a child's terms. You yes. know. Just as Home Alone is, you know, like a home invasion movie understood on a child's terms. And, you know, it's not like that movie is necessarily, you know, less assertive of the status quo at the end. Ooh, I, I love how that dog gets like blasted back. Um, but it is interesting because it integrates the childhood part of it a little bit more than this movie. Of course, to do that, you have to be committed to doing it, you know, which is the movie is not as committed to really doing uh, one specific thing. Oh, God. I think this was fun to film. I think it was a huge pain in the ass. No, I mean, like, for the actors. But I still think it was a huge pain in the ass. I mean, I, I think, it, you know, it's, you're under a lot of... This reminds me of Jurassic Park, for a weird reason with Laura Dern and Sam Neill against the door yeah. and she's reaching for the gun. 
And then she always has that crazy, like, was that line where she's like, I can't get it like my mom or something? Is that what she says? I don't remember. I she's don't trying remember. to get the gun with her leg. And it's like, what? What does that mean? I need to rewatch Jurassic Park. It's been too long. Tell us about your mom. <laughs> what did she do with a gun trying to get it while holding on to a door? <laughs> this is the end, friend. I love that kid's delivery of that. It's so, like, flat. <laughs> it's yeah. very weird. This is the end, friend. <laughs> Although, again, that line carries more weight if you have this movie be more focused on their dynamic, right? Of course, the real challenge, even more so necessarily than the, uh, you know, childhood performance in, in doing the movie that way is to actually have the doll hold up that much. You'd have to be very clever with it because part of the effectiveness of movies like this is uh, being very good at suggestion and actually not showing you the doll for as long as you think you're looking at it, right? Yeah. You can say the same thing about Jurassic Park. How many minutes of CGI are in that movie? It's like seven minutes, right? You feel like there's a dinosaur in every scene, but there actually isn't. No. Because it's, it's just, well directed. And it's super memorable when it is on there. And yeah. Then. It's the same thing with this movie where I don't actually know how much time you see Chucky really on screen, but you do see a lot of like, you know, separate limbs, right? You get a lot of POV. It's a way of keeping the cost down so you don't have these long shooting days where it just takes a long time to rig the doll over and over again, right? Um, and it's never one doll, right? You have to build different dolls to do different things in different scenes, right? So it's a real challenge to do a movie like this. Um, and part of making it work is, uh, ooh, I kind of like that, the way he's so cruel and trips him. You think you would just stab him at this point? Oh, wait, no, he can't. He needs the boy alive. Ooh, it's so creepy. That image is probably the scariest thing in the movie. Oh, this, God. The slow walk forward. The, like, tar monster version of Chucky? Yeah. Which I haven't seen Bride of Chucky in a while, but, like, the doll is just, like, it has a fucked up face, but that's about it. I can't remember if she did something to, like, assemble it back together, but... You can't really assemble it from it being burnt and melted. I don't know. Now, Max, here's my next question. Yes. Have you ever heard of a movie called The Shining? Uh, in passing, not though too often. It was directed by some hack, right? Never, yeah. Never had any other good movies. Neil Breen. Oh, okay. It's a departure from his previous work. Less black tank tops. Boo. Did I get you? <laughs> Not at all. Oh. It was funny. Good, good timing for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ooh, you know what else this reminds me of? This version of the Chucky doll is uh, Stripe. Oh, it is kind of like Terminator, right? Yeah. You just won't stop. You, you just kill him over and over again, and it's just not over. He's, he even got some wires leaking out. But no, it reminds me a lot of uh, Stripe at the end of Gremlins. And also now The Black oh, Knight. Yeah. yeah. Another movie that I think is okay. And, and yet it's still not over. Let me ask you, do you think this scene goes on for a little bit I longer? was going to bring that up earlier, but I didn't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer. But yes, I think Chucky's death scene goes on for way too long. Like you have the lighting on fire, then you have the reveal that he's not dead, and then you have the whole chase around scene throughout the bathroom, and like, then you finally go through with it here. Chris Sarandon just demonstrating his uselessness. Yeah. Oh, I got stabbed. You gotta take my gun. Oh. <laughs> you know what would have been really helpful? If uh, they asked the voodoo man how to kill it oh this guy's really helpful too and he's not even really dead yet yeah part of the problem with this is that you get you get the false resolution of of like them killing him the first time and then it immediately goes to the the revival 
and then we get this scene. You can't have the false resolution twice. You know what I mean? You need to somehow have this scene if you really need this scene to happen, which you don't, right? You need to have it spursed out over like, or just spaced out while Chucky is disappearing. You know what I mean? You yeah. have one false resolution, not two. Because then it just feels longer than it is. Jesus Christ, come on. And we're going to draw it out as much as possible. Is he going to touch it? Oh, oh, he touched it. Oh, he touched it again. Oh, God. But here's the real question. Is, does this guy know that it's an evil doll? No, he doesn't. He was just wondering why his partner was freaking out. So, so there's really no reason at all to have this elongated sequence. There's no reason to protract this other than to just set up the contrived uh, false resolution. Although that said, when it arrives, I appreciate that uh, the way it happens, right? Where he comes out through the grave. Yeah, because you're focusing on the head. Because he yeah. thinks it's going to bite him or something, but no, the... And I think it really should rip this character's throat out because he's just so useless. Well, I guess you wanted some, like, because I guess the idea is you wanted somebody who wasn't involved to see that it was real. But then, like, even at the end, well, he's just like, yeah, I believe you, but who's going to believe me? Yeah, like, we don't even see, like, at the end, like, there's really, like, anything happens. It's just nothing. At the very least, I'd sue the shit out of that company. You make your dolls too but fucking durable. Well, yeah, that's the thing that, like, is going to happen. I don't know how the new Child's Play ends, but does it end with Aubrey Plaza suing the fuck out of whoever <laughs> made the new My Buddy dolls? <laughs> that's what you'd have to do, right? At least in America. Yeah. And now it's finally over. Well, they just blame whatever sweatshop they had it made in, and then... You know what's sad to me about this movie, what? too? Is uh, I know you're not the biggest fan of the movie I'm about to mention, but this came out the same weekend as Pumpkinhead, directed by Stan Winston, which is a uh, a movie that I like a decent amount more than this. I think Pumpkinhead is like not the most interesting movie ever. It's like a decent yeah. monster. Um, decent monster is a good way to describe Pumpkinhead. But I whole. think it's like an interesting version of that type of horror story, and I think it's very sincere in how it engages with like the the actual character dynamics going on because it's a very like old story about somebody who is wants it worth revenge. rewatching i haven't seen it since i was like 15 years I, old it's surprisingly emotional okay um i'll give it a rewatch and there's an interesting twist on the whole like revenge thing where like um oh my god speaking of terminator what the fuck he's a robot in aliens he's bishop what is his name oh god i have I'm right there. How? How is this happening? I always forget his name, too. I feel but this bad. is a super, like, cheesy ending, by the way. We're going to get this freeze frame. I just wanted him to be like, all I wanted was a friend or something like that. Some emotion for him at the end. But, yeah, that's the end of Child's Play. Kind of a... Lance Henriksen. Yeah. There we go. So Lance Henriksen in the movie, I think one of the most interesting parts about it is how it has this twist where, like, he goes to, like, the mountain people like community like local witch woman to sick the pumpkin head on these people or learn how to do it sort of yeah and then he does it and then he feels so much regret immediately you know what i mean yeah because they killed his kid but he feels so terrible right away and i just think it's an interesting like emotional situation because that movie is so sincere and I think it amounts to a movie that kind of flies by more than this one does and I think it's I think this movie has good pacing for the most part until right. the end, which and drags then it really on drags. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so this has been child's play. It's a pretty good movie. It's sort of right down the middle. Yeah. It's got some interesting stuff. It didn't capitalize on all its, uh, you know, opinions if you ask us. Uh, but I think they did a really good job just in terms of the Cinema execution, cinematography, practical effects. I think yeah. they did a very good job. It's um, well directed. Uh, I, I think wish it did more with its premise or decided on a premise or, aesthetics but like or didn't go the directions it did in the sequel apparently yeah that's that's an entirely different beast though that's like 
talking about Friday the 13th versus like Jason X. Like, you know what I'm more excited to do? What? Fright Night. I, you know, I what? think that movie's more interesting. No, we talk one. about double featureds a lot. Yeah. I would love to do Fright Night versus the Fright Night remake just because it's like an interesting, like, what is going on here? Yeah, I remember seeing the Fright Night remake and I thought it wasn't like awful. No, it wasn't. But I hadn't seen the original one first. David Tennant gives a lovely performance in that movie. At any rate, I think that movie is interesting because it yeah. has some, it's, it's doing some more unconventional things with like the subtext of the sexuality and stuff in that movie. I think it's neat. Also, Chris Sarandon is a great vampire. Yeah. I think we can all agree on that. But at any rate, this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We are on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. And we have a Letterboxd account where you can catch up with all the movies we've done. Max, do you have anything else to say on this movie? On this particular movie? Um, I'd probably rather watch this than watch the new one. But uh, if you guys see the new one and it's actually much better than this, let us know uh, on our social media and I might check it out. Yeah. And let us know if you'd like to see Max fight a cassowary or just walk up to one. For $500 on? For a little bit more than that. (laughs) You'll be talking to me, not to Max. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Don't expect to spend a little bit more than $500. Max, what I've been thinking, actually, for that, I'll like make you wear a sombrero with like hot dogs hanging on strings off the side of it. That's the next tier up. Okay. We, we got to plan this out, Austin. All right. My so death, we'll see you people. My death isn't going to be as drawn out as Chucky's. Okay. <laughs> but this ending will. Yep. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.